all of you in the room. His most uh, recent book, which John Stewart interviewed him about on The Daily Show, uh, is uh, called Why Government Fails So Often and How It Can Do Better. Uh, Kate Andreas is, uh, sitting to my left, is uh, assistant professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School. Prior to joining the Michigan Law Faculty, she was the special assistant and associate counsel to President Obama, as well as chief of staff of the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, she writes in the fields of constitutional, administrative, labor, and election law. Uh, Rick Pildes, uh, sitting all the way uh, over to the left, is the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law. Uh, prior to joining the NYU faculty, Rick taught at uh, Michigan and practiced law as well at Foley Hoag, um, now Foley Hoag um, in Boston. He's written broadly in the field of public law and is probably best known for his contributions to the law of democracy and the separation of powers. He's been the recipient of uh, numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Carnegie Scholarship, and the nomination for an Emmy. <laughs> Um, the structure that today's panel is going to be that each of the, the speakers, uh, in the order in which I just introduced them, will speak uh, 12 to 15 minutes. Um, and uh, so Peter will speak first, followed by Kate, then Rick. Uh, we'll have a little bit of time for a panel discussion and then open it up for general uh, Q&A. Uh, and I've been asked to instruct you to walk up to the microphone so that this can be caught uh, on video. And we'll end at around 3.15 uh, for a short break between uh, the next afternoon session. So Peter. Thank you very much, Dan, and, and to Mike, uh, and to Stanford for convening this uh, very promising, uh, we'll see how it goes, but very promising uh, conference. Um, and I, I think being here is a lot more uh, interesting, actually, not as quite as exciting, but more interesting than being on John Stewart. Um, but uh, because I think the, the ideas will flow more uh, naturally. Hmm. Um, I have very little time, as we, as we all do, so I'm, I'm going to make five main points. Uh, uh, the first point is that gridlock and partisanship are design features of our system, not design flaws. Um, and if they are pathological, as most people who comment on these uh, matters uh, seem to think, then the system that spawned them is indeed uh, pathological. In my view, uh, gridlock and partisanship are not pathological. They are frustrating. Uh, they're often very ugly. Uh, but uh, they are how a democratic uh, system should work under a constitution uh, which was designed to impede expansive government in domestic affairs unless it could assemble the clear majority uh, necessary to overcome the many veto points that the constitution designed into the system. Gridlock and partisanship uh, began shortly after the constitution was uh, ratified, uh, right after Washington's inauguration, indeed, uh, over the Bank of the US, uh, over the Jay Treaty, and many other uh, what then would not have been called uh, hot button issues, but, uh, but we know them as, as that. Uh, at times, uh, at, at the time that this uh, began to, the, that this proliferation of partisanship and gridlock began to appear, uh, federal the federal domestic policy agenda was minuscule compared to today's administrative state. That's the first point, uh, that these, this is not a pathological uh, excrescence uh, from our system, but actually the the working out of the design of the system. Um, second point has to do with the nature of uh, today's party system. It's a very fragmented system. Uh, we have the Tea Party. We have Republican mainstream uh, uh, actors. We have the White House wing of the Democratic Party. We have the congressional wing of the Democratic Party. We have state parties, and as Nelson Polsby uh, uh, emphasized, we really have 50 party systems, uh, not, not one. Even more decentralized uh, it, uh, is the system because of reduced control over candidates. Um, this is an extremely important factor, uh, it seems to me, in understanding uh, our politics today and, and the concerns that we will be discussing over the next uh, two days. Um, Campaign finance reforms, including McCain-Feingold, I think are 
to a considerable degree responsible for this de decentralization of authority and the reduced control uh, of parties over their candidates, the reduced uh, discipline uh, and policy coherence that results uh, from this uh, loss of control by parties. Um, the other point I want to make about the, the t nature of today's party system, it is very much what the last generation of reformers embodied in the American Political Science Association uh, committee that was established to review the party system. It's exactly what they wanted, a competing, a system of competing ideologically coherent parties to offer choice and accountability. Uh, they called it responsible party government. Uh, so uh, it's a, maybe another instance of the old admonition to be careful what you wish for. Um, the third point has to do with the social sources of gridlock and partisanship. The most important one, I think, is the incomparable social diversity, including religious and cultural diversity uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, in, in a book on diversity that I wrote about 10 years ago, I, I started off by saying that the United States is by far the most diverse society on Earth, with the possible exception of India. Uh, but it's certainly the most diverse uh, one in the uh, industrialized world. And I think uh, often we academics don't sufficiently appreciate the, the extent of this diversity, particularly in the religious realm, uh, and, um, and its effect on, uh, on political divisions and divisions over social policy issues. Uh, this has been coupled in recent years, this diversity has been coupled in recent years with uh, uh, more residential homogeneity so that we probably, if that's the case, uh, uh, speak less to people who disagree with us uh, than we did uh, in the old days when we lived cheek by jowl with uh, people who were from very diverse backgrounds and, uh, and religions and orientations. There are a, a, a second source of, uh, of gridlock and partisanship or deep divisions within the public over the role of government. And the parties do reflect this, and they should reflect this. Um, there are also deep divisions within the public over specific policy issues. That naturally flows from division about the role of government, but uh, even, even with respect to those who can agree upon uh, whether government is legitimately uh, uh, embedded in a particular area of regulation or other uh, policy, uh, there are very striking differences. Uh, over uh, the, the appropriate policy responses. About 45% of voters call themselves independents, but that's very, very misleading. The vast majority of so-called independent voters are closet partisans uh, who lean strongly toward one party or the other. True independents are only about 10% of the population. Uh, so. Uh, the, the divisions uh, between us along party lines is even greater than the, uh, the tripartite division between Republicans, Democrats, and Independents uh, would suggest. Uh, my fourth point is to raise a question. Are partisanship and, and gridlock problems, and if so, why? With regard to partisanship, it's true that the Constitution wasn't designed for such a party system. But it was recognized, the party system was recognized uh, as such in uh, the 12th Amendment in 1804. And uh, it seems clear in retrospect, uh, at least, that the party system was necessary to, it was a necessary expedient to overcome the fragmentation that was ordained by the Constitution. It's hard to imagine any other kind of response uh, that would have uh, rendered government uh, workable at all. Again, with regard to, regard to partisanship, uh, uh, another truth is that the public is disgusted with the parties. But here I want to make uh, two observations. First is that at the same time the public complains about partisanship, it has become more partisan, strikingly more partisan. Uh, and secondly, that public disgust with partisan wrangling could be wrong. The public's wrong about a lot of things. Uh, we all know that. Uh, we uh, take the public to task uh, for disagreeing with us on many, on, on many things. Um, but more fundamentally, the public has not 
carefully considered the trade-offs and the alternatives to our system, which people like us uh, traffic in. Um, and uh, those trade-offs are pretty daunting, and the alternatives uh, are not very attractive. One alternative is for weaker parties with more independent candidates. That's, by independent, I mean candidates who are independent of their parties, uh, even to a greater extent uh, than uh, today. Uh, uh, what that is almost certainly going to lead to, and we're certainly moving in that direction, um, is less discipline by parties over their candidates, less policy coherence, and less accountability to the public, um, because responsibility for policy outcomes is, is more diffuse and difficult to, uh, to identify. Another alternative is the Westminster system with stronger parties. Uh, there are many advantages to a Westminster system, uh, certainly less gridlock, clearer accountability, but there are some serious disadvantages. Uh, in any event, to move toward a Westminster system, we would need a new constitution. Uh, and uh, that's not in the cards. And again, I would urge us to be careful what we wish for. Um, and as to gridlock, uh, I have much the same analysis uh, uh, as I did with regard to partisanship. It, it's grounded in the party system, which in turn is grounded in social divisions. What is gridlocked to one side is, to the other side, skepticism about the role of government and its performance. When a clear majority demands action, then politicians will respond uh, with compromise. We've seen two examples of that in the last week which are very striking uh, uh, because, uh, well, for, for several reasons. Uh, one example is the nuclear agreement with Iran. Uh, the second is, just announced yesterday, uh, uh, the compromise on fast-track authority uh, uh, for the president to negotiate a trans-Pacific uh, trade uh, a treaty. I think we'll expect, uh, we can expect more of this in Congress as the Republicans uh, recognize that they have to show some solid legal achievements uh, before the uh, two, 2016 uh, election. Um, the, uh, one of the interesting features of this, uh, uh, these, these two examples, is that they're showing uh, the underlying fissures within the Democratic Party, uh, both on trade and on, uh, and on uh, foreign affairs, particularly with regard to the Mideast um, and the nuclear deal. And uh, those fissures suggest, they're not pathological, they suggest that, again, we're a deeply divided people and, and deeply, with deeply divided parties. Um, so the, the process, as I've said, is, is, is frustrating, it's costly, uh, uh, and in some ways it's, it's uh, deeply uh, troubling, I think, to, uh, to our society, uh, our political system. Uh, and that uh, one, one example of that is the confirmation process. And Ann O'Connell, uh, my colleague for this uh, semester at uh, Berkeley, has just written a very interesting paper uh, in which she mobilized a lot of data on trends in confirmation, uh, the, amount of, uh, the, the amount of time it takes to confirm uh, officials and, and judges, and, uh, and also the uh, outcomes of partisan wrangling over those. Uh, my final point uh, has to do with gridlock. The standard explanations are either refuted or called into serious question, I believe, by empirical data. Uh, the political scientists uh, tell us that well-organized economic interests almost always get their way. They tell us that that's not true. I stated that poorly. Uh, the, 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 the basic claim is by uh, many people uh, uh, in, in this room, I suspect, that well-organized economic interests almost always get their way. Political scientists tell us that's not, uh, that's not true. Um, another, uh, another standard explanation is that big donors control electoral and policy outcomes and push the parties to the extreme. Again, the political scientists tell us that small contributors are the most extreme, uh, that although we have the Koch brothers on one side, we have Soros and Bloomberg and Steyer and many others uh, on the other side, and that the relationship between money and outcomes in elections is far more tenuous, far more tenuous than uh, the uh, standard conversation suggests. 
Uh, a third uh, standard explanation is that campaign, the campaign for reform, the campaign finance uh, system is is uh, is deeply broken, and that the reforms are straightforward. Um, overrule Citizens United, increase disclosure, public financing of elections. Again, the political scientists tell us, and I just came from a conference in which this was discussed at, with, with uh, a great interest, um, tell us that there are serious problems with all of these, uh, all of these remedies. Um, and my last point, relative to this question of campaign finance, which I think many people think is at the heart of uh, whatever pathologies we observe, uh, is to beware of incumbents designing campaign finance and electoral rules. The First Amendment, I believe, is only one of the likely victims of incumbent uh, architecture uh, with respect to campaigns. So I suspect we'll discuss uh, uh, all these issues uh, in, the, in the panels ahead. Um, let me now yield to Kate. Great. Um, well, first, I just wanted to thank Michael McConnell and Jed Campbell for having me. I'm delighted to be here, and um, thank you for putting on such a great event. Um, Peter talked about how partisanship and gridlock are not as significant problems as the conventional wisdom holds. I also want to push back against the conventional account, but in a different way. Um, first, I wanted to just start by saying a word about the conventional account and the extent to which I agree with it. So I don't think anyone can contest can contest the deep polarization and partisanship that characterizes American government today. This hyperpolarization causes legislative gridlock, which in turn creates incentives for the executive to innovate through the administrative state. Executive branch innovation in the face of partisan gridlock can be viewed as either a positive or a negative force. On the positive side, the president and agencies are able to adapt old statutes to changing conditions, even when Congress fails to amend the law. They can address pressing social problems when Congress is paralyzed. They do this through traditional notice and comment regulation, through producing policy guidance, through exercising um, discretion in enforcement, through issuing waivers, through creating new interagency arrangements, and so on. On the negative side, um, when the executive uses the administrative state to advance a policy agenda not achievable in the gridlock Congress, it sometimes does so in a way that pushes the bounds of formal power without adequate check or accountability. So in short, I think there is no doubt that partisanship contributes to gridlock and that this has significant impact on executive power and on the day-to-day -day workings of the administrative state. But the argument I want to make today is that this conventional story is, is not the full story, and that if we want to understand the problem of gridlock and even the extent to which it is a problem, we need to pay attention not only to the role of partisanship, but also to the role that money plays in constitutional governance. So existing theories, I think, offer an account of gridlock that's essentially undifferentiated and transubstantive. Republicans and Democrats fight each other. Nothing gets done in Congress. Meanwhile, the executive branch advances either a Republican or a Democratic agenda, depending on the party of the president. When we look at the effect of money, however, I think the picture becomes more complicated. Government fails to act not only because of partisan divides, but also because of the capacity and incentive for organized wealthy interests to exploit veto points. Unlike partisan gridlock, this dynamic extends to the administrative state. Indeed, it's particularly prevalent in low salient, low visibility areas. So for example, the shaping of a committee agenda or a regulatory agenda as opposed to the content of a presidential executive order. Moreover, as a normative matter, this kind of failure to act, I think, is more problematic than partisan gridlock because it's less a product of deep divides in political opinion and more a failure of democratic participation and democratic accountability. And the problem I want to suggest is becoming more acute as economic inequality widens and as the political participation gap between the wealthy and other Americans expands as well. So let me unpack the connection between wealth and the, the organized wealth and the problem of both traditional gridlock and a broader failure of government to act. Uh, first, wealthy interests have particular capacity to exploit veto points in both Congress and throughout the regulatory state. Um, they, when, as individuals, um, wealthy Americans participate in the political and governing process at far higher rates than middle income and poor Americans, and they spend far more money on their participation. <coughs> but even more important is organizational disparity. 
Organizations representing wealthy interests and businesses are far more numerous and far better, better funded than organizations representing middle income Americans, consumers, workers, students, and so on. And organizations representing the poor barely register at all in studies documenting participation in government. <coughs> wealthy organizations use their resources wisely. They donate strategically to members of Congress who serve on key congressional committees. They lobby members of Congress and administration officials. They produce voluminous comments during the regulatory process. They participate informally and formally in the OIRA review process. They provide information and expertise to rulemakers and lawmakers along the way. And they threaten legal challenge to potential policy actions. These are all techniques that are not dispositive, but they can be effective at shaping the legislative and regulatory agenda and slowing or stymieing both legislative and regulatory change. Recent experience with the implementation of financial regulatory reform illustrates the extent to which wealthy organizations dominate without countervailing inputs. Um, to give just one example of many, during the year following the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act, regulators at the three major banking agencies reported meeting with the 20 big banks about 1,300 times, um, while groups favoring tighter regulations of the financial markets appear only about 200 times in the logs. Um, so second, not only do wealthy interests have the capacity to exploit veto points at disproportionate rates, they also have particular incentive to do so. They are generally doing pretty well under the status quo. Research suggests that the most common goal of paid lobbyists is to protect the status quo from potential change. The research also demonstrates that, what, that this is what expensive lobbyists are particularly good at doing, um, not so much enacting um, statutes, but blocking change. So gridlock, or the problem of why so little gets done in Washington from this perspective, is not an inability of both sides to reach a solution to a problem, but rather the dominance of those who favor the status quo over those who would support change. Third, at least sometimes, uh, wealthy interests also benefit uniquely from gridlock and other forms of policy stasis because they can affect change through market conditions. That is, because industry frequently has control over the market conditions against which regulation operates, legal stasis does not mean actual stasis, but rather it means that the locus of change is shifted to private ordering. So consider, example that, for example, the track record on labor and employment regulation. The statutory and regulatory regimes have not been updated substantially in many years, but it's not the case that the law on the ground has remained the same. The law is of declining relevance as employers have reorganized supply chains, have limited their liability under existing regulations through offshoring, subcontracting, and classifying workers as independent contractors, among other strategies. So whether you think the kind of gridlock or policy stasis I'm talking about as a problem depends on your perspective. Under traditional understandings of our constitutions, functional goals, you could argue it both ways. For example, you could argue that the dynamic I described supports the constitutional goal of protecting liberty. Effective organization by wealthy interest functions to moderate and limit government action, even in times of unified government, and even by agencies operating without traditional check. My view, however, is that our constitutional structure and our administrative laws aim not only at stopping or slowing government action, but also at avoiding the concentration of power in too few hands and in producing democratically accountable government. And our, our um, current system <coughs> fails on that score. So contrary to what Peter said, I think there's actually mounting data demonstrating that government is far more responsive to the preferences and interests of well-organized um, groups, and particularly economic elites and organized business groups. One recent study um, indicates that federal legislators consistently appear to pay no attention to the views of millions of their constituents in the bottom third of the income distribution. Undermining traditional assumptions about partisanship, these trends hold under both Republican and Democratic administrations, albeit to different extents. So in short, our system assumes a pluralism that doesn't exist. And the dominance of organized wealth in practice, including its ability to exacerbate gridlock or slow regulatory changes, even in the face of majority popular support for such change, undermines the goals of democratic accountability. So I'll say just a few words about where I think um, those observations might lead constitutional and administrative law. Um, first, uh, my argument raises the possibility that courts should adopt a default rule of greater scrutiny of government action where there's been disproportionate influence of wealth or an absence of countervailing organization. 
Some, of the, some version of this was tried by the DC Circuit for a while and then rejected by the court in Vermont Yankee as a matter of statutory interpretation of the APA, but it could still be done outside the APA or in other ways not foreclosed by Vermont Yankee. And indeed, you see that district courts continue to express worries about regulatory capture and to adjust their review accordingly. Ultimately, though, I have concerns about this approach on the ground that the judiciary is neither well suited to figuring out if a particular group's dominated a particular government action, nor is the judicial process any less likely to be influenced by resources than is the political process. Institutional design reform is, I think, a better place to focus, but current proposals are insufficient. Existing proposals aimed at reducing gridlock seek to create more moderate, less polarized, and less fragmented political parties. These are important proposals, but if the government's failure to solve pressing policy problems is not just about partisanship, but also about the dominance of wealth, additional prescriptions are necessary. Our law must do more to facilitate participation in governance by those without wealth. Traditional good governance proposals, which focus on transparency, on providing opportunity for public comment, and also on campaign finance reform, do not accomplish this. Current participation gaps demonstrate that it's not sufficient just to lower the barriers to participation, nor is it effective, even if it were constitutional, to try to cap participation by the wealthy. Law reform proposals should also focus on facilitating countervailing organization. So just a couple of ideas of how we might do so. First, administrative law and process could do more to provide a formal role in governance for membership organizations. That is, organizations that derive high proportions of funding from membership contributions um, from natural persons and uh, uh, who, have, who enjoy rights to participate in associational decision making. Um, this could be done through any number of routes, such as soliciting um, or even requiring participation in congressional hearings, in federal advisory committees, and meetings with OIRA, with the Domestic Policy Council, and with other administrative offices. But second, to make such governance reforms work, membership organizations representing low and middle income Amer Americans have to be more prevalent. To that end, labor law could be reformed to encourage worker organization, though perhaps <coughs> in different forms than currently exist. Law could facilitate membership organizations among um, low and middle income Americans in contexts other than the workplace. Political parties could um, be redesigned to strengthen the role of rank and file members. And we could consider unfettering the political activity of existing membership associations by reforming tax law to incentivize rather than penalize political activity. What such reforms would look like and their relative merits is obviously far beyond the scope of this conference. Uh, but, and in fact, there are a number of interesting models one can look at from new governance proposals and from states and localities. But my point for these purposes is just that we need to think about the distribution of political and economic power when we talk about gridlock, partisanship, and the administrative state. Thank you. Rick. Thanks, Dan, uh, and to Kate and uh, Peter. Um, I have to say it does seem a bit surreal to talk about polarization and conflict in the midst of Palo Alto's always you know, gorgeous, perfect uh, climate. Um, the idea of conflict and polarization seems very kind of remote from the moment. But, uh, but anyway. Um, I do want to uh, pick up on what uh, Kate mentioned, which is what I call our hyper-polarized democracy in America that we have uh, experienced through our era of democratic governance. Uh, and I thought I would show you just two slides to try to um, convey some historical perspective on this phenomenon uh, of our era of democratic politics. Um, don't be too intimidated by this. It's actually easier to make sense of than it might seem. This is the most famous chart in the study of political polarization in Congress historically in the United States. So the chart begins here in the 1870s, and this is up to the present. The red and blue lines just chart the House and Senate, and the only point of that is to show you that polarization today in the House and the Senate are actually fairly similar, a little bit less in the Senate, but the same in the House. So one thing I want you to see here, and this is partly responsive to Peter's comments, is that there are sort of three general eras of the way the political party system has worked in the United States and the way our democracy has worked, at least in the halls of Congress. The first is the post-Civil War era in which we had substantial levels of partisan conflict uh, up until the 1930s or so, the early 1930s. 
uh, and the solidification over time of the FDR administration. Then for most of the 20th century, up until the mid-1970s, we had historically very low levels of political polarization in the government, in Congress. And then starting in the mid-1970s and moving up kind of inexorably and relentlessly and steadily since the mid-1970s, we've had increasing partisan polarization to a level which now exceeds any level in past American history since the Civil War. Okay. Now there are, I think, a number of things you can understand about polarization immediately off of this chart if you sort of un, you know, focus on certain aspects of it. Um, one, when we compare American governance, government, governance and its performance in the past, uh, it's much too, much too abstract in my view to talk about the constitutional architecture as having been designed to make it difficult for majorities to legislate. Uh, that's certainly true as a general matter, but the way that system has actually functioned is very enormously over time as a result of something the framers of the Constitution didn't anticipate and actually tried to design the Constitution to prevent, which is the emergence of political parties, which indeed are essential and necessary aspects and elements and organizations in making democracy work in any large-scale society. So. Once you see, one thing you can see from this chart is, um, given how steadily the increase in political polarization has been ever since the late 1970s, um, it's very difficult to attribute it to particular political personalities at various moments. You know, during the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, liberals thought George W. Bush was the most polarizing president in history. Republicans now feel that way about President Obama, whether it's Nancy Pelosi or Newt Gingrich. Uh, the, something much deeper is going on here than anything having to do with individual personalities. Second, to the extent people think there are institutional fixes for polarization, uh, such as changing the design of election districts, reducing gerrymandering, other sorts of institutional fixes that, that are proposed, I think you have to appreciate that we're seeing something that is, is a deep, fundamental kind of transformation in the nature of American politics. And another point you can see from this is that we're not talking about something that's just a function of our moment in a narrow sense. We're talking about our era of democratic politics understood fairly broadly. Uh, and for that reason, I also think it's unlikely to expect that this dynamic is going to change in any dramatic way, you know, absent some major exogenous shock to the political system, war, or comparable kinds of events. Um, so let me say a word about the causes of this polarization and then a word about its uh, implications and consequences. Uh, in my view, in the view of a number of political scientists, the deep underlying cause of the polarization of our era is the, I would say, maturation of American democracy that occurred, began to occur in 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Era, which brought into democratic politics in the South the previously disenfranchised and excluded African-American population of the South, as well as many poor white voters, who were also excluded by the various disenfranchising techniques of literacy tests, poll taxes, understanding clauses, moral character requirements, and the like. Uh, throughout most of the 20th century, no, through all of the 20th century, the American South was a very strangely organized political party system. It was a one-party political monopoly completely controlled by the Democratic Party with no competition from a significant or even existent Republican Party. It's only when black and poor white voters were brought into the party system, into political participation beginning in the mid-60s, that you start seeing more liberal forces pushing on that one-party democratic monopoly in the South. You know, eventually, over several decades, you 
begin to get the movement of conservative whites into a new Republican Party in the South. The Democratic Party moves to the left and becomes much more liberal. Uh, and the national political parties reflect these transformations. Uh, and what you get is the ideological purification of the political parties and the sorting of voters by ideology into the political parties. Throughout this previous long era in the 20th century, we didn't really have a two-party system. We had what political scientists call the four-party system, conservative Southern Democrats, more liberal Northern Democrats, uh, conservative Republicans in the Midwest, more liberal Republicans in the West and the Northeast. And so everything people say about the great statesmen of the past who were able to compromise or negotiate across divisions, uh, the statesmen of the past that we no longer have, those people, in my view, were made possible by the larger structural environment in which they worked, functioned, which is this highly fragmented four-party system. So what has fundamentally transformed as you can see here, I think, is the nature of the party system and the ideological working out of these transformations that began in the 1960s. Now that's all to say that one way you could look at this picture, and the way I tend to look at it is, we had a sort of aberrational state of governance and politics for much of the 20th century when polarization was at these very low levels because of this very fragmented four-party system. Uh, and what we're seeing now, I believe, is much more what you might think of as the normal workings of the American democratic two-party system once we develop full political participation. Okay. Um, now, what are the uh, consequences of this? Just the second slide, is just to give you a little taste of this, you know, again, to provide some grounding for these abstract discussions, this is a chart that measures the red line going down is a way of measuring increasing polarization. This is from World War II, I'm sorry, to the present. And the blue line going up is of the major issues of the day identified in various sorts of social scientific ways, uh, what percentage of those was Congress unable to address? So you see back in the post-World War II period, only 30% of the major issues of the day were unable to be addressed by a system that, as Peter says, was designed to make it difficult to mobilize concerted political power into legislative action. Uh, and by the present period now, we're up to 70% uh, of the major issues uh, of the day uh, that we have gridlock around. Okay, so I think you have to be, you know, grounded in changes over time to begin to try to understand what is our moment, how does it differ from previous moments in the past. Uh, now, what are some consequences or implications of this? Um, there are lots of directions one could go. I thought I would just talk a little bit about uh, consequences that one might think about for judicial review. When the courts look at the actions of other institutions of government, whether it's the president, Congress, the administrative agencies, and other institutions of government. Uh, and the way I like to frame this is that courts can take one of two views towards other institutions. They can take what I call a more institutionally formalist view, or they can take a more institutionally realist view. And the emergence of hyperpolarization uh, of our system is going to push this question in a more and more, more and more acute form onto the courts. You know, how much of this institutional reality should courts take into account, or how much should they blind themselves to that uh, in, a, in, in a more institutionally formalist vein? What I mean by institutional formalism is a view that these institutions are essentially black box kinds of entities. The Constitution created them with certain powers and certain limits. Uh, we shouldn't open up the box in any particular way. The institution should be sort of imagined as the same institution over time. Uh, and 
uh, I think there's a very powerful pull for many of us, but certainly for courts, to think of institutions in that way. I think it's the sort of default position uh, that courts would tend to say, at least, is the position they ought to take. So it doesn't matter if Congress is a different institution today than in this period, or the presidency uh, in the age of the television, let's say, is a radically different institution than in earlier moments in American history. Uh, of course, the institutionally realist view suggests courts ought to take changes in the way these institutions function over time into uh, account. Uh, now, I actually think that uh, American courts have been always deeply divided and torn about how formalist or realist to be about the institutions of government that they're assessing. Uh, and I think it's for very powerful reasons the courts are torn in this way. Uh, and I think there's no clear solution to this question of how formalist or realist courts ought to be about other institutions. Um, but let me give you a few examples, you know, and then think about the polarization uh, contribution to this discussion. I never know why I write these notes. I can't <laughs> get myself to look at them once I, once I write them. Um, the most famous separation of powers opinion in American history is the steel, steel seizure case about President Truman's seizure of the steel mills during the Korean War. Uh, and in one of the most celebrated separation of powers opinions uh, in the canon, uh, Justice Jackson, who was a great realist, uh, said something about why he was deciding against President Truman in that case that I think has been mostly ignored in the way we teach constitutional law. Jackson says, we have to understand the president today is the head of a political party system. And his party members will show loyalty to him in Congress. The president isn't the kind of president he was before the party system. Uh, and so to the extent this is my words now. I mean, to the extent the old Madisonian original view was institutions will check institutions, Jackson is saying that's no longer as realistic an account of how these institutions operate. Democrats in Congress will support Democratic presidents. And what follows from that? Jackson thought that was a reason he ought to read the statutes that had been enacted that were relevant to the steel seizure uh, narrowly, so as not to see those statutes as giving Jack uh, Truman, I'm sorry, the power to do this. In other words, go back to Congress, Mr. President, if you're actually going to have the constitutional authority to engage in this action. Now, as I say, in my view, throughout all of constitutional law and administrative law, behind the surface of cases, this question is lurking about how formalist or realist courts should be and how they interpret the actions or how they assess the actions of other institutions. Uh, it's true for those of you, I don't know how many students are here, you know, who are in the midst of federal courts. And this has always been the central issue in the field of federal courts. Is a state court a court just like any other court? Are all courts the same? Should we essentialize the institution? That's the view of the Hart and Wexler case book. The answer is yes. The realist view is state courts work very differently than federal courts, uh, partly because judges are elected, but also for other kinds of reasons. Uh, therefore, federal courts should be more aggressive in second guessing, if you will, the actions of state courts in areas like habeas corpus uh, on the criminal side. So with respect to the issues of hyperpolarization today, the question is, given the lack of legislative capacity to address many of the major issues that the public at least says are the major issues of the day, uh, first, it's inevitable, as Kate said, that other institutions, whether it's the president or administrative agencies, uh, are going to fill that vacuum 
Uh, but then secondly, how much should courts take this reality about the institutions of governance today into account? Uh, that could mean, for example, that because statutes in all sorts of important fields cannot be updated in the face of what are truly changing scientific, economic, other sorts of conditions, um, should courts allow agencies to read statutes somewhat more expansively than the courts might have in an era in which there was much greater confidence that Congress could step back into the picture? I believe that's already happened. So I believe when the US Supreme Court in a five to four decision in the first greenhouse gas case that went to the court, when the court held that the EPA uh, not only had the authority but the obligation to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, uh, I think that recognition, at least by the majority of the court, that Congress was not going to act at all in that area was an important part of the sort of atmospherics of decision in that case. Now, no justice would ever say that. Uh, and in fact, Justice Kennedy testified recently to Congress and said, well, of course, we should assume Congress will do what Congress does, which is legislate. Uh, but that's what, of course, judges under this rule of law understanding have to say. And I would be surprised if you would say anything differently about that. Um, so I think we already see some signs of that happening. Similarly, with respect to the presidency, should courts be more flexible in how they read the statutes that govern presidential powers, given the recognition of lack of legislative capacity in the conventional legislative process? Uh, this question will be in the background of ordinary issues of statutory interpretation. Uh, the healthcare case right now is a version of this. Uh, in an era in which there was confidence Congress would legislate to fix, I want to say glitches in statutes, to fix problems that emerge in the structure of a statute that there's no arguable policy reason Congress adopted initially. So language that leads to certain consequences that no one in Congress said was an intentional policy choice. You know, in an era where Congress was active in legislating, uh, courts might be inclined to be more textually tight about how they read statutes. Should courts read statutes more purposefully uh, in an era in which they know there's less likelihood of congressional response, whichever way courts decide the question. Um, should courts change doctrines like what's called st statutory stare decisis, meaning that courts will not revisit their interpretation of a statute once at least the Supreme Court has spoken, because Congress can always revisit the statute and change the interpretation. You know, again, in an era in which there is less legislative capacity to respond, uh, should courts, will courts, uh, become a little bit looser in how they apply that kind of doctrine? So, you know, I guess two points here to bring this together. One is this tension between institutional formalism and institutional realism. Uh, seems to me a, a central, pervasive, profound, but I think not generally or widely appreciated aspect of judicial decision making with respect to the performance of public institutions. Uh, I also think there's no straightforward answer to this question. I think um, judges cannot be institutionally formalist all the time, and, they, and I think they are not. I think they do take into account changes over time in the way these institutions perform, at least to some extent. Sometimes you see it explicitly. Most often, uh, it may be more sub silentio. Um, but I don't think that judges can wholeheartedly embrace institutional realism also, because that seems far too subjective. It seems dangerous. Opening up the black box of how these institutions are actually functioning leads to judgments that may seem much more subjective. 
uh, on the part of courts. And then the last point to tie it together is just again to make the assertion that the era of hyperpolarized democracy in America, this long era, inevitably is going to be putting pressure on courts to have to confront exactly this question, how formalist or how realist to be, whether they talk about it explicitly or not. Thanks. Great. So why don't we have a little bit of discussion amongst the panel. Um, with a title like Gridlock, Partisanship, and the Administrative State, uh, there are obviously a lot of different themes that have been spelled out by the various panelists. I think we can distinguish uh, sort of four different questions that have been each uh, kind of covered here. Uh, the first, which Rick talks about most, is the causes of polarization. Uh, the second question you could think of as, what are the effects of polarization in Congress on agencies? Uh, the third, which there was a, perhaps a little bit less discussion about, is uh, whether there's polarization within administrative agencies. And then the fourth, uh, which kind of Rick and Kate talked about, is how administrative law should deal with the fact of, of polarization. And so let me just kind of uh, make two observations in terms of how uh, these points connect and then throw it open to the panel to kind of react to this. And I'll kind of work backward. I think uh, uh, Rick started off in really giving the predominant social scientific account of polarization, which is that uh, although people point to things like uh, sort of uh, campaign uh, finance, the filibuster, uh, various house rules. Uh, really, the consensus, I think, within social, within, uh, social science tends to focus on long-term structural causes that have generated uh, sort of uh, really sharp degrees of polarization over the last 40 years. And those really uh, are uh, sort of three predominant ones are inequality, uh, kind of voting rights, and the party realignment uh, in the South. And I think that connects in an interesting way with kind of both uh, with uh, points that both Peter and Kate have made, and Peter started off saying that uh, in many ways this is uh, something that goes back to the founding. Uh, but what uh, Rick's kind of showing the data sh uh, sort of uh, displays is uh, this is actually somewhat of a rupture, at least within uh, the the last forty years. And I think to the extent we point to divisions amongst the broader public. Uh, there's somewhat less evidence that uh, that political scientists believe. They, the, the general evidence on this is that elites tend to be much more polarized uh, than the masses, including uh, sort of constituencies within uh, their own district. Um, uh, though Kate's uh, focus on kind of wealth in the administrative state is interesting because it does comport with uh, at least one striking correlation that people like Nolan McCarty have focused on, which is that there is a very striking correlation between measures of income inequality and polarization. Uh, so if you plot something like the Gini coefficient and, and the measure of polarization that, that Rick has had put up there, there's actually a really strong correlation. Let me at least say one other note in terms of how these the comments here connect, I think, on the, the judicial review side. Um, so uh, what's interesting about Rick's point about institutional formalism and institutional realism is that at least part of the bottom line here is that what courts may want to do is to give more deference to agency decisions in a hyperpolarized environment because the Congress may be less likely to actually update statutory meanings. Uh, what's interesting about that is actually it, it is in some tension, at least, when you couple the Gini coefficient finding and polarization with Kate's point, uh, which was uh, one that there actually should be somewhat less deference when you've got uh, kind of evidence uh, that wealthier interests have had disproportionate voice in a particular rulemaking, uh, for instance. And so what's interesting about that is at this historical juncture, if you buy that correlation, these are two uh, takeaways that actually might cut uh, in, in slightly different uh, directions in terms of how courts should be dealing with this. But with that, I'll, I'll just uh, throw it open to the panel to, to kind of respond. And why don't we start back off with Peter, since uh, you were the first. Well, uh, it, I found Rick's um, charts, very graphs, very interesting. Uh, uh, but what he didn't say, and what I think is highly relevant to the discussion in, in this panel and perhaps to the conference as a whole, is that you could draw the very same chart with the very same trajectory, it might even be steeper, uh, in terms of the expansion of the uh, federal government. Um, let me give you some, let me give you some uh, metrics of that. Um, the Federal Register has grown two and a half times faster than the economy over a long period of time, and the ratio of final rules issued by federal agencies to laws passed by Congress in the last decade has been 223 to 1 not counting Obamacare and many 
of the Dodd-Frank regulations that are still uh, being developed uh, five years later. Um, uh, today, federal domestic spending is at the highest share of gross domestic product since the end of World War II. A larger share of Americans receive entitlements than ever before. The federal government now backs 90% of new mortgages. That was when I wrote this two years ago. It's now up around 95%, I think. Um, uh, the number of regulatory agency staff members has ballooned, uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the extent of um, uh, expansion of the administrative state in, in other areas has uh, increased uh, enormously. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's imperative that we consider what the relationship between those two developments is. The number of lobbyists and the amount of money that's been poured into lobbying um, in, in, in Washington is directly correlated, I believe, with the expansion of the stakes in policymaking in Washington. Uh, as, the, as the stakes have risen, as the uh, areas of intervention have uh, widened, uh, and as the depth of penetration of the uh, state in, uh, in decision making has increased, uh, the proliferation of lobbyists is, is followed as night follows day. Uh, so, and I think we all agree that this proliferation of lobbyists has a lot to do with the uh, polarization that's been observed in the gridlock as well. So I, I think that we've got to put that on the, uh, on the agenda as well if we're going to discuss uh, what, to, what causes uh, partisanship and gridlock today. Well, I would just say, I, I mean, I feel we should take questions. I don't want to monopolize the time too much. But I feel like I should say that, uh, yes, the story of the expansion of fed the federal government and the higher stakes uh, in what the federal government is addressing certainly is going to draw much more attention to Washington and to national politics. I don't see that reflected so clearly in these charts because, as I said, you know, from the early 1930s all the way through the mid to late 1970s, we were at the nadir of political polarization uh, historically. So it's not the case that the most dramatic expansion of the federal government produce this kind of polarization among the parties. I mean, it is true that in the 1970s and the, and the sort of the second wave of regulation, the environmental regulatory statutes, OSHA and the like, drew much more business opposition and did bring business much more into the political sphere and did generate a much, you know, much more in the way of, of the development of lobbying arms of business and the like. But I, I don't think that the large historical patterns on polarization can be explained by that. I, I think that you know, just as in the late 19th and early 20th century, when conservative, large landholding southern elites drove populist coalitions of blacks and poor whites in the South out of politics because of the economic differences, that um, it's not the size of the federal government. It's the, I don't know. It's it's who's participating in politics and what they are demanding of government. But maybe that's not a full answer. I just think the, the first point is the one that's more important here. It doesn't really reflect the chart. So I, I, I want to direct you two things. One is I also was going to point out that the striking um, correlation between the the chart that Rick put up about um, polarization and the very same the charts on inequality actually track it almost um, almost. Uh, Exactly, um, but I, but I, um, but I wanted to, to reflect a bit on this question about what role for courts. Um, like Rick, my intuition is that there is a role for functionalism um, in decision making. But I wonder um, whether your um, observations about polarization hold also for the judiciary, and therefore how that might change um, your. Um, sort of faith in the court's ability to sort out what's going in the black box in a way that counteracts um, some of the problems of polarization that you've identified. So I guess I'm actually just throwing a question at you rather than, a, than an answer. But. Can I defer to <laughs> collect more questions? I sure. Why don't we throw it open for questions? Uh, 
I guess this question is first for uh, Professor Pildes. Um, so you, you indicated that, I guess I don't know whether you were supporting this or not, but maybe that due to gridlock, the court should show more deference uh, to the agencies because, well, you know, this, this statute, Congress is not available essentially to, to rewrite this statute. But you could easily look at that the other direction, which is that if you defer to the agency and Congress is not available to check and restrain the agency, um, uh, and you're now putting the judiciary into a position of deference where they're not checking or restraining the agency, it, it seems to me like you're sort of proposing uh, that we're sort of, we, we hand power to the executive um, because Congress can't act. And it seems to me that sort of is directly in conflict with, with what Professor Chuck was saying, which is the underlying structure of the Constitution is, is not to create sort of an elected monarchy in the, in the executive. Um, so if you could respond. Um, so I, I think that, you know, you and Kate and actually Dan and his question have identified the, the paradox about the situation. And uh, I wasn't, I'm trying to develop possibilities here, I think, uh, in how we might think or courts might think about these kinds of questions or the issues that get raised as a result of the circumstance we're in. So, I mean, I do think the thing that's inevitable is that when there's public demand for action, uh, you know, at, at substantial levels, um, that may not be enough for Congress to press Congress to legislate in the kind of hyperpolarized environment we have, because presidents are elected and have to respond to these demands if they want to stay in office, and because they increasingly exercise presidential control over the agencies, uh, and the agencies will therefore also be more inclined to act to respond to these kinds of changing circumstances and demands, you will see more aggressive action in both administrations, uh, in administrations of both parties. And the question then is what courts should do in response to that. And as I said, one possibility is courts should, should acknowledge and accept that dynamic and what explains it. The other concern is exactly what you say, which is the capacity of the executive branch to get away with action will be substantially expanded when Congress is going to be paralyzed in either direction no matter you know, which way the executive branch goes. So those are two competing kind of pushes and pulls here. Um, but I, and so I'm not offering some generalized solution to that paradox. But I do think you see courts already to some extent showing a little bit more deference. The, again, the EPA case to me, the mass versus EPA case, is the most striking example so far. I, I, I'd be suspicious of that case coming out the same way if the court saw that there was significant legislative action in this area, whatever the content of that action might be. Um, so I'm not, I didn't mean to be making a strong recommendation that courts should do this. The question I'm trying to raise, should they be realist in this way and what should that realism mean? I really enjoyed the panel. And I had a question about the gridlock aspect of it. I wonder, how do you measure gridlock? I thought one of the comments that Professor Shuck suggested, we shouldn't just be looking at the output of the legislature, we should be looking at the output of the agencies as well. <coughs> and if we did that, does it look like less gridlocky um, if we do that? And I'm also wondering, given the party polarization that Professor Pildes has talked about, whether we see the similar sort of gridlock, if there is gridlock at the federal level, at the state level as well. Right. Do we, so do we know that this phenomenon that you've identified as party polarization has actually had the same effect at the state level? And I'll look forward to your response. I'll answer if you want. Um, so on the state level point first, your second point, you know, it's always been the case that state level politics has tended to be a little less ideological and more pragmatic. People are looking for various sorts of services to be delivered uh, and the like. You know, at the same time, it is true that we are seeing increasing polarization uh, of the political parties at the state level and in state legislatures. So the phenomenon that, that chart demonstrated is going on in the states as well, not quite as dramatic. 
Uh, but the issues in state politics may not always lend themselves to quite a sharp a partisan uh, filter when the issues are a little bit more pragmatically oriented in various sorts of ways. Uh, how do we know if there's gridlock uh, or not? Uh, obviously a very tough question. That's why I tried to show you a chart uh, that was looking for you know, relatively objective measures based on public demand uh, or public ranking of, of the, the major issues of the day to see how much action is taking place on them. But I think you can also look in areas where it's obvious government must act and the failures of government to be able to act that are strikingly you know, clear in this era compared to other moments. The shutting down of the federal government twice uh, in this era of hyperpolarized political parties. Uh, the dancing on the knife's edge of a US governmental default uh, on its credit obligations. Uh, the inability of the congressional process to generate budgets uh, in normal order. Uh, so leaving aside issues like climate change uh, or immigration, where it might be that inaction reflects some deep set of divisions that the system with separated powers just can't act on, I think these other areas are, are the really striking signs of the lack of or loss of legislative capacity in the system. Uh, shall I come uh, on, your, on the other point that you raised uh, with respect to uh, polarization within regulation, uh, within the uh, Minister of Agencies, uh, one of the purposes of uh, Congress passing regulatory statutes is that it can move the venue of, uh, of, of disputation uh, from Congress to the agencies, but of course Congress maintains its, uh, its role and its capacity to, to act. So. Uh, yes, there's been a vast expansion in, uh, in, in regulation in areas that uh, create a great deal of div divisiveness. Um, and uh, what we see is Congress responding to that in, in a number of different areas. So immigration is, an, is one in which I'm especially interested. Uh, the president's executive order uh, has led to uh, uh, enormous uh, backlash in Congress and whether legislation will be enacted uh, is or whether the court will be uh, will be willing to overrule this uh, those are those are separate questions but uh, the point is that the policy issue the policy development at the administrative level uh, uh, shifts to some extent the politics to the agency but then uh, back to uh, back to Congress so immigration is one example dodd Frank and the Volcker Rule is another example. Obamacare is obvious example. The Republicans uh, seem uh, uh, incapable of, uh, of uh, legislating uh, a, a change in that policy. Uh, net neutrality, uh, the FCC, good example of extraordinarily controversial uh, policy which affects uh, uh, business interests uh, differentially, uh, so uh, it may be that uh, they, the opposing sides will neutralize each other and uh, net neutrality will have a second dimension of neutrality and, and the uh, FCC will be able to uh, implement, its, uh, implement its policy. But um, it, is a, it is a continuing back and forth between the, the agencies and, uh, and Congress um, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, we see accelerating in this period of increased regulation. I mean, just two other points. I, I think um, in periods of unified government, um, we've seen greater delegations to Congress, right? So, um, I mean, sorry, to agencies. So that um, it, then that expansion that you're pointing out in terms of additional rulemaking comes about because of new statutes that delegate greater authority to the um, administrative state. Um, and the Congress is less likely to delegate in periods of um, divided government because of polarization, or that's what the political science suggests at least. Um, and then the, the other point is that um, in terms of polarizations um, within states, in addition to the point Rick made, we, can, we also see sort of an interstate polarization so that you have a number of states that are looking quite blue, right, with unified government, um, uh, for example, California, right, <laughs> um, and, and other states that are quite red, like take Kansas. Um, so you see polarization but occurring um, uh, less within the state and more as between states. 
I'll, I'll add one, I mean, other example really on Peter's uh, sort of FCC example. Uh, there are some studies that basically look at votes uh, by these independent regulatory commissions. And, and uh, the, the patterns actually do track uh, some of the stuff that we see on the congressional side, which is that since the 1980s, there's been much more of a split along the kind of uh, Republican and Democratic appointees uh, on the, the commission, um, and that there are far more extremists that have been appointed, people who, are, who really kind of dissent quite frequently um, since then. Uh, that evidence also kind of uh, shed some insight into the kind of uh, policy solutions people have proposed, like transparency, right? Some, you, you, when you read this literature, there's some people who, promote, who, who say there should be more transparency. Uh, some people say, say there should be less. Um, at, at least uh, in the FCC context, what you'll you know, see is that basically because of these Sunshine Act type requirements, it's much harder for uh, sort of individual commissioners to talk to one another about particular items. And so uh, a lot of that gets channeled through staff. And because through some of the redesigns of these agencies, the chair has an extraordinary amount of power in actually appointing staff. That has increased uh, the kind of power of the chair, who, who's, of course, uh, sort of removable at will by the president, right? And so, so those are the kind of interesting dynamics that you can get. On the state side, I mean, uh, um, there's also, that, that's in some sense, I think, where some of the most interesting social science is being done. Uh, so we get some of the best evidence as to the causes of polarization when people compare states with different institutional rules. So Ray LaRaja has a piece that shows that states with more party-centered campaign finance laws uh, tend to have slightly less polarized legislatures. And so you, you're able to kind of figure out uh, uh, and, and, and nail down uh, what some of the institutional solutions might be. First of all, I've enjoyed the panel very much. Uh, I, too, wanted to ask about the issue of gridlock, but from a slightly different standpoint, which is there seems to be a shared assumption or a wide assumption that gridlock is a bad thing. From where I sit, it may well be that when you have you know, what Professor Andreas referred to as unified government, that people see what comes out of that unified government, and they react to it in the next election. They say, we don't like that. We, and they view partisanship or having party control being a different party than the executive as a check and balance rather than as a, a bad thing. So I, there seems to be a shared assumption that gridlock is bad. I'm not sure it necessarily is. It may be a political reaction to overreach when one party has sole control. And the other part of that is <clears throat> I also see this um, frustration with gridlock as leading to an expansion of executive power. Immigration was mentioned. There are other areas as well. And I'd like to ask about the role of congressional standing, because as I read the government's briefs, both in the immigration context and in the litigation pending in D.C. that Professor Turley is involved in regarding a uh, challenge to Obamacare for executive overreach, the government's position seems to be that no federal court has jurisdiction, Congress doesn't have standing, nobody has standing, and therefore the only reactions to that can be to vote the guy out, which of course now you can't do because we're in a second term, or impeach, which the votes aren't there. So the government's position seems to now be, you can't do anything about the executive overreach. And I'm wondering what the doctrine of congressional standing tells us about the ability of the courts to deal with all of that. I mean, I guess oh. I, I'll, on the first one, I actually didn't read the panel to, to share the uniform assumption that gridlock is necessarily bad. I think actually the way I, I, I took kind of Peter's comments was that this isn't actually necessarily bad. One, because he demonstrates in his book how often government you know, implementation uh, of, of policies can, can fail. And, and, and the other is that uh, at least Peter's view, I think, is that, that this stems from deep divisions uh, from the American public at large. Uh, in terms of what we want out of out of uh, policies, um, and 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 even Kate, I didn't quite read to to necessarily think it's bad because there is, is this innovation promotion component to it, um, and and at least uh, uh, Kate's chief point was less about gridlock and and about kind of wealth disparities. But um, just to add one point to that, uh, gridlock is an epithet that's used to denounce uh, something that's not being done. Uh, the other side thinks that something shouldn't be done uh, or something else should be done. Uh, so uh, you know, we, we need to be very careful uh, about the ideological deployment of gridlock on both the left and the right. It generally means I want something done and you're not doing it. Yeah, I don't, so uh, that, that can be a concern. Um, but 
I think that, first of all, you have to be careful about distinguishing divided government from legislative incapacity to act on major issues of the day. So, you know, I myself tend to prefer divided government also. Uh, I think you get more checks and balances in the, in the deliberate process. I think the quality of legislation that emerges is probably better in general. But, you know, that's in a context where the party system has the capacity to work with these differences and actually address the issues. What you're seeing, I think, in part from that chart I showed you, is a, a, an inability to move forward in the face of those divisions. I mean, keep in mind, by the way, also that because control of each of the three institutions of government is regularly up for grabs now, or perceived to be in every election, the presidency, the Senate, and the House, uh, and we are in the longest period of time where that's been true consecutively over as many elections as it has been since, again, the late 19th century, that's going to accentuate this polarization dynamic all the more because you know each party is going to feel in the next election it can capture one of the institutions it doesn't currently hold. So that, so that also fuels this um, dynamic. I, 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 where I disagree with Peter is that, uh, I mean, I suppose one way you could put this is what percent of public support does it take to overcome the very fragmented system that, that we originally you know, had designed into the constitutional architecture. And I suppose one way of putting the point is that from the data and other things um, I could point you to, it takes a lot more of that, at much higher levels than it did in various moments in the past. So to just lump everything, all forms of inaction into gridlock and then say it's just my policy that I prefer isn't being enacted I think that that misdescribes the nature of this era. Uh, two, um, two reactions. So on your first point, um, I do think it's important to distinguish between different kinds of gridlock or policy stasis. I mean, gridlock might not always be the right term. So when gridlock, when the um, reflects uh, deep divides in political opinion, um, that doesn't and the inability of Congress to enact legislation. Um, uh, embracing one opinion or the other does not seem like a, um, a failure in the same way that w that um, overwhelming majority support for a particular policy goal that Congress then fails to enact it seems like a much uh, a bigger problem from a um, from a perspective of democratic accountability on your second point I don't want to speak about the administration's litigating position or congressional standing but I, I would just say that it I don't think it's anyone's position that there is nothing Congress can do uh, Congress can pass legislation uh, to respond to the administration's actions Congress has a great deal of oversight authority Congress has a, um, a great deal of power through um, through the power of the purse um, and it has um, uh, on occasion, exercise that quite effectively at, um, in, in order to rein in administrative or executive branch action. Well, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, expand on, on Rick's uh, last point. Uh, what percentage of support does a, how much support does a measure need? Well, Obamacare passed with one vote in the Senate. And it's no surprise then that uh, there has been a tremendous blowback uh, against it. Um, and uh, I think the answer is uh, that you need more than 50 plus one uh, in, order to, to, in order to enact and implement successfully and effectively without too much uh, blowback uh, a major, one of the, probably the most important social measure in, in the last uh, 50 years. <clears throat> so great panel. Uh, and pointing us, obviously, to one of the great dilemmas of our time. So I, am for one, uh, deplore the loss of the moderate wings of both parties, as you talk, talked about, Rick, thus driving them further apart and making it almost impossible to compromise. Um, so my question is your chart. It's, it's just about up to 1.0, meaning that we can't agree on anything. Um, and is it going to stay that way for the next 100 years? <laughs> um, I mean, is it there and leveling off close to one, uh, unless some big exogenous shock comes along? Uh, if so, I mean, I fear for the future of our republic. And so I'd like to, I wonder if, what, what you think about this? 
Um, I was surprised, Peter, when you said that only 10% are true independents, um, because I think it's more than that. People who don't, don't identify with parties and will swing um, quite sharply between the two, often based on personalities. But one of the important deciding factors in elections over the years uh, has been a sense of um, moderation and immoderation. And, and when candidates are perceived by a lot of people <clears throat> as being too extreme, uh, they tend to be defeated. I'm thinking McGovern on one side or Goldwater on the other, um, which who are um, perceived as being too extreme and lost in landslides. Uh, and if these highly polarized parties become, are perceived as being more and more extreme, won't there be a movement back towards moderation? I think I, that the answer is yes. There will be. Uh, a lot of those, a lot of the people who identify as Democrats are, are moderate Democrats and, uh, and similarly on the Republican side. Although the Republican side has become more, I think, more extreme uh, than the Democratic side uh, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, ideological ident identification. Um, but yes, there will, be, there will be a swing back. I have no doubt of that. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I wrote this article about hyperpolarized parties in America. I don't remember, it came out five or six years ago, and it was a fairly sober, pessimistic projection of the future. Um, and, and then I've had people say to me, you know, I thought that was really bleak, and actually that turned out to be pretty prescient. Um, and I think that we're still, there's still more purification of the parties to be worked out, but it's, it's fairly small at this point. Um, you know, I would never predict a hundred years uh, down the road. I mean, I think it's likely to be for the foreseeable future, you know, absent, as I said, some very large shock to the political system. I think the massive entry of his, the Hispanic population into actual political participation if they, you know, start, when they start voting in very large numbers, it's conceivable that could destabilize the system as could external events. But I think fundamentally we are gonna have political parties that are ideologically more unified and that are more sharply differentiated from each other. And I think that that is likely to be the enduring state. And then the question is, how can we make these institutions work, which I think were not designed for that kind of structure? Because as I say, they weren't designed for political parties in the first place. You know, are there ways of making that structure deliver legislative output for public goods and services for which there is you know, substantial kind of public demand? Um, I have some theories about that, but I won't bore you with them at the moment, although Dan alluded to one of my pet reform proposals, which is to try to reinvigorate party leaders and give them more control over their members in various sorts of ways. Because the party leaders ultimately have the greatest incentives to make the party brand as broadly appealing to a national electorate as possible. And so I think that's where you're, in, in this kind of system, that's where you're most likely to get the sources of, of deal making on big issues. My turn? Yes. Yes. I agree with that point. Uh, if we gave the parties more power, more access to money, as opposed to super PACs, the party leaders could have more discipline over their uh, people. Um, I can't remember who said it. Was it Mark Twain or Will Rogers that said uh, we're only safe when the Congress isn't in session? Does Texas anybody remember? Said, what? said about the Texas legislature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the administrative agencies are always in session. They never leave us alone. Um, we had the uh, nuclear depository killed by an administrative, administrative agency, and now the government has to give back literally billions and billions of dollars to the electric utilities. And uh, somewhere in Dodd-Frank, or is it the healthcare law, there's a, an administrative group <coughs> that is beyond politics. It can't be uh, overturned by an act of Congress. 
that uh, thing that uh, I think you're referring to the Consumer Finance Protection Board. That's it. Yeah. No, the medical. Uh, well, there's medical that too. Well, there, but there's one in Dodd Frank also. That's the one in Dodd Frank. Yeah. So how can we no, have? No, it doesn't say it can't be repealed. No, but it makes it so extremely. You have to stand repealed. on one yeah. letter. Uh, a certain day of the year. Well, that was my comment. I just want to clarify one thing in, uh, that I said in response to uh, Rick, uh, in response to the question, which is, it's not that I, I agree with Rick's. Uh, uh, observation that there's a purification ritual that is still ongoing and, and has some distance to go. I, I was referring to policy outcomes. I have no doubt that policy outcomes in the end uh, will be uh, will be more moderate than the extremes of the parties uh, want. So I have two quick points about uh, polarization and or at the agency level. Uh, one is just about sort of measuring uh, polarization, and uh, um, part of it is the uh, Dan's point about what, how, how votes are cast inside. Uh, but I also think there, it's an interesting thing, I don't know of any studies on this, but that there ought to be in a world of polarized politics, which leads to, if it does, leads to polarization in agencies, you ought to, able to, be, you ought to be able to observe a dramatic reversals of agency positions uh, as the Democrats take over an agency that had previously been controlled by Republicans or the other way around. I mean, we know that that's true historically of the uh, National Labor Relations Board. Uh, it would be just interesting to see how it ha how if it's happening with respect to other uh, agencies. Uh, the second point is on, uh, this is tied to the uh, increase in agency uh, authority or exercises of agency power, uh, which is, um, I'll put this in sort of propositional form, uh, whenever a new problem arises, it never arises in the context in which there is no statute authorizing an agency to take jurisdiction over it, or at least no statute that cannot be construed to authorize the agency to take over. So this is the uh, Freeman Spence uh, article on old, sta old statutes and new problems. Uh, uh, and, and net neutrality is one. I, you know, uh, 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 is the internet a common carrier? Apparently, yes. I mean, common carrier language goes back to you know, the 17th century. Uh, but they have authority over common carrier, so OK. Um, so, so one of the issues is going to be not merely the uh, exercise of clearly delegated authority, uh, but the exercise of authority arguably delegated generations ago in existing statutes, uh, and then what posture the courts will take with respect to those kinds of exercises. In, in, in a context where I think had the delegation occurred 10 years ago, the courts would have said, of course, this is you know, Chevron permissible. Uh, but when it's a 40-year-old statute, which is what we're experiencing with some of the environmental stuff, it's not clear that that's either the right response or the one that the court will take. I'll say a quick point on the kind of polarization within agency. I think uh, I think it's a really nice point in terms of trying to measure more reversals. Uh, what's easy about the the votes is right they they actually will occur on, in an actual reporter, so it's easy to, to to collect those. And and a lot of this stuff in terms of reversals can happen internal to the agency, not necessarily observable to, to researcher in all instances. Uh, but it's a really interesting way to try to measure it. Another way that I've thought of is is uh, just. Divergences of opinion between staff and political appointees has that increased over time, um, as a as a way of trying to to kind of take this into account. No, I think Mark described the problem beautifully, um, and it kind of comes down to uh, how much courts will be willing to see elephants in mouse holes, as Justice Scalia put it. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. That is, you know, when you have statutes that were written long ago, and they're the only sources of authority as circumstances change in many, various fields, you know, how far will courts permit or not permit agencies to stretch that authority? 
I mean as a legal matter, without the question of is there substantial evidence for the underlying judgment and, and all of that. So, you know, in the telecom area in the 1990s, right, the court per Justice Scalia said, well, modifying tariff rules given the changing nature of the telecom sector means sort of small incremental changes, not ones that uh, in the MCI case, I think it was MCI, right? You know, basically get rid of the tariff regulatory regime for lots of carriers. Now, in that area, Congress did get back into the picture in the mid 1990s. We had a you know the massive redoing of the telecom structure through the Telecom Act. Was it 96? Um, but I don't know. Are there good reasons to think it's more likely to get congressional action over that set of issues rather than others? Does it matter that that was already 20 years ago almost? As we see the you know mounting forces of political polarization, but I, I you know I think you framed the question very eloquently. I mean, it goes. I, I think it really ties into the the point that Rick has been making about institutional formalism, um, and uh, and really the broader debates about functionalism versus formalism, which is the big debate we've had in terms of the interpretation of and the scope of Chevron. Right, the point you're making, uh, Mark, about should it matter that the a uh, statute was enacted 40 years ago as opposed to 10 years ago. There's one way of reading it that no, it, it, it you know that that's what goes under the old kind of Skidmore test of of various factors that determine the the degree of deference and and should we have a more categorical application of Chevron deference that isn't necessarily tied to those kinds of factors and that I think is in many ways uh, Rick's point about institutional realism. I mean, in another doctrinal approach, the court could allow agencies less leeway to change positions for political reasons. Um, the court has not done that, right, and has actually um, enabled agencies to shift. Um, but perhaps um, the changing partisan dynamics will, might cause changes there all, as well. I have three comments on uh, Kate Andreas's very interesting talk. Uh, they'll sound like arguments. Uh, they're actually they're actually not arguments. They're suggestions uh, okay. because I think I think that her overall argument is interesting and, and is something that deserves work. Um, uh, and they're they're sort of empirical on uh, lobbying expenditures, both in gross and uh, dividing them up on uh, in in different categories. Uh, I just want to to note. Uh, that what we have is campaign finance data and uh, data on expenditures by register of lobbyists. Those are, that's a very small share of the amount of money that's spent to influence government. Uh, the lobbyists are Congress, and there's an enormous amount of money, uh, more and more these days, that is spent in extremely clever and subtle ways that never goes through register of lobbyists. And in fact, registered lobbying expenditures are, are going down. And where the administrative state is concerned, the subject of this conference, nothing gets recorded. It's lawyers, and it is uh, consultants, and it is research groups of one kind or another uh, that participate in, uh, essentially, especially in rulemaking proceedings. If we had complete data, I don't know that it would be different in the different kind of distributional uh, things that you're interested in. I, I, don't, I don't have any guess about that, but the amount of data we have is such a small share of the total data that it, it could go in any, any direction. Uh, the uh, the pre-Vermont Yankee DC circuit, Leventhal and uh, Skelly Wright and so forth, they believed in the capture theory and they were worried that with these new health, safety, and environmental agencies uh, that big business interests were going to crush uh, the little people and the membership groups and the environmental groups. And what is, what, what, what is I, th I think remarkable is that they did not get their way. They wanted to change the procedures to give some of these newer groups a, uh, a leg up because they had imbibed the capture theory. They didn't get their way, but the environmental groups, the membership organizations have not done that poorly. Those cases were about nuclear power and the anti-nuclear power groups have done very, very well at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission over the decades. If we asked ExxonMobil uh, uh, about EPA, they'd say, the Environmental Defense Fund and the Sierra Club own, it, own the place. We can't get any, you know, they're just, they kill us all the time. If we ask the Sierra Club people, they'll say the same thing about ExxonMobil. Um, we have made 
fabulous investments in environmental quality since Vermont Yankee. Um, the uh, environmental groups routinely, do they always win? As saying, you know, measuring what happens in a rulemaking proposal and what happens at the end, it's a very tricky business, but it is not the case that the wealthy somehow defined have their way at NHTSA uh, at, uh, uh, or the big manufacturing uh, corporations that they win all the time. They lose a lot. Third, <coughs> on, you have to be careful about the distributional consequences of regulation and to simply say that there are the wealthy parties at the agencies and there are the middle class and the poor parties at the agencies. Th that, that really doesn't capture a lot of what is going on. I'll give you two examples. Uh, at the time of the Airline Deregulation Act, the airline industry spent a huge amount of money to see that it didn't happen. Everybody knew the CAB was running a cartel. Everybody. Eastern Airlines, uh, Senator Kennedy, Fred Kahn, everybody assumed that the rents were going to the owners. Okay? Everybody was wrong. Everybody. The rents were going to organized labor. They were going to pilots mechanics and flight attendants. This, this is all clear. Nobody really expected that to be the case. If you go to uh, any safety regulation, but it's particularly uh, strong in environmental regulation, environmental regulations are sales taxes. Sales taxes are passed on to consumers. They are purchasing uh, environmental values, and it would be easy to tell a story uh, that a strong pro uh, environmental regulatory decision is uh, redistributing uh, downward from down to up. I'm not asserting that that's the case, but you can tell the story. The immediate participants, ExxonMobil actually, because the regulations cover across the industries, across the board, they're not being paid by the industries. If you looked at, say, today, coal versus other producers of uh, fuel, I have no doubt that the owners of uh, the, the capital investors in coal are losing out differentially. But in most cases, it is consumers that are, that are paying. And it's not, just, it's not just the wealthy, even if these are big corporations that are paying. I've gone on too long. But, there, but those are three things. There, there are subtleties in this argument that I think you need to get a little bit further into. You want to respond to this briefly before we? I appreciate the points. I mean, I certainly, I certainly agree that um, it's not the case that the wealthy always win at agencies um, at, or in Congress. And I don't mean to be just mean to be suggesting otherwise. There's certainly there's a, there's a lot of um, as you point out um, problem. There's there's a great deal of empirical research documenting many of the things I talked about. There's also lots of complications in the empirical data and a lot of ways in which it's limited. And I, I take the points. It's a very very quick good addition. Um, it, it's not simply consumers that, uh, that pay a tax. It's, uh, if you look at any environmental dispute carefully, you find that it's industry versus industry. Uh, and uh, the environmental regulations, including those which are very uh, valuable, socially valuable, and easily pass a, pass a cost-benefit analysis, are, uh, are really struggles between tech, different technologies and, uh, and, and providers. So there's a competitive story as well as a cost increasing story. Although I would just say on that point, I mean, in some sense that, that underlines the point I was making, which is that um, it, it often will have multiple industries weighing in on one issue. There is still a, a participation gap in terms of who's, uh, who's sort of at the table and participating in many contexts, not all. And certainly the, the union example is a good one. And, and, and has, the, the picture has changed dramatically since the 1980s in terms of the, um, the organizational um, rates among workers. We're almost out of time. So why don't we give Don Elliott the last question until we break. Well, it's just a, a comment following on this last discussion. And that is that uh, Senator Muskie also believed in the capture theory, and he, in some famous debates between him and, and Senator Jackson, um, specifically designed EPA, which then Nixon picked up, to be captured by environmentalists because he believed that they would be the repeat players. So I think the different structures of agencies, Kate, make a big difference in terms of your, your story. So I just want to 
endorse the notion that maybe we have to distinguish and there are ways to design agencies that either maximize or minimize the, uh, the extent that the wealthy have influence. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a comment. I did have a brief question, and that is, I wonder if the panel can give us any more enlightenment about what is good gridlock or blocking and, and what's bad. I've heard a couple of different theories. The wealthy have too much influence. Um, if there are deep divisions in Congress, if there's public demand, but is there anything else that, you know, standing outside the system and looking at it helps us distinguish when it's appropriate to block initiatives and when we should regard the blocking of initiatives uh, as a pathology? Um, uh, we're out of time, so uh, why don't we take that offline um, and we can, lots more discussions. To